fall asleep at night, the closer we get to the meetings, my thoughts wander. And I pray that all of these papers with images and words will bear fruit. We still have some left. If you have friends or places where you would still like to leave them, um, they're available. Um, if you would like some, I mean, you can maybe raise your hand right now if you like one, if you'd like a packet to pass on. If not, on your way out today, um, please take, take with you. Um, I was praying and I heard the testimony, a 10 second testimony that someone invited to a meeting three years ago to something like this and they're here. And when you start to think about the implications that something this tiny could connect someone with the hope of eternal life. It's crazy. It's crazy to think that something left at Kroger's, something that someone finds as they're looking for milk, or something that someone gets by a passing stranger with a smile, that the Holy Spirit can use these imperfect means to bring eternal life to the reach of so many. It's well worth blanketing our, our area with these invitations. So please take. Kathy and, and Diana are back there. If you would like to take some right now before we even start, just raise your hand real quick if you would like a packet. We have some hands up here. If you would like to take, and you, you can take it now. I highly plead with you, please take these. Whatever is left, if we don't pass them out, I'm going to ask the guests that we get here Monday night to take all our surplus and invite their friends and families. I know that they're, they will be excited to hear what the Lord has to say about our world and about our ultimate destiny. So please, this, is, this Sabbath, this weekend, is our last push before Monday. And above all, above all, everything we ought to be doing what is the one thing that all of us can do? Pray. Are you praying for this series, my friend? Are you praying for me? Are you praying for the people that are singing, for the camera crew, for the internet, for the equipment? You won't believe how God has been answering prayer so far, above and beyond what we could ask or think. We have awesome equipment. We have a brand new projector that someone just got for us. Um, if God is providing all that stuff, it's because he's going to do something. It's not, be, it's not so that we can just sit and look at pretty pictures in a wall. God is going to convert souls from darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it will be crazy to think that in eternity we will shake hands with individuals who read something, who read a piece of paper in someone's yard. And that triggered, and that provided you with material to impress their hearts. And their lives will not just be impacted in eternity, but they will experience your blessings even now. The ones we relish on, the ones we receive daily and are aware of, many times take for granted. As the pastor, Father, this morning, I want to ask you to please keep your promise that when we ask you, will give us the Holy Spirit. Not because we're good or righteous, but because we need it to be good and righteous. Give us your Holy Spirit this morning. Unplug our ears. Take the calluses and the numbness out of our hearts. That when we hear we will yield. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. This Sabbath, we're talking about consecration. 
It's a consecration service, and it's entitled All of Me. As I've done in previous occasions, you know I like to consult the dictionary. It can help us better grasp some of the words we use. And the word consecration, maybe some of you already know this, is to dedicate something for religious or divine purposes, to set something apart for holy use, for holy purposes. And this morning, the sermon is going to be based on two concepts. We can only relate to God as pagans, or we can only relate to God in holiness. And what I mean by pagan is a human-made method to relate to God. That's what paganism is. It's human-invented religions. Holiness is a divine, revealed religion. And we can only relate to God in our own devisings, and we don't need to be out in a culture foreign to Christianity to relate to God as, as if we were pagans. For many centuries, the Christian church taught and related to God through paganism. And the Protestant Reformation was raised up to restore how humanity relates to God, not as pagans, but as children of God. Children called to an experience called holiness. This morning we wanted to discover, develop this concept of consecration because I began to, even preparing for this sermon, my, my gut instinct, my knee-jerk reaction was paganism. We're going to somehow, I need to somehow come up with a sermon that will say, let us be consecrated. That is a false statement. When I went to the Bible, I saw that what I was going to be preparing and what I've heard many times and what I was already leaning towards was preparing us to relate to God as pagans and not through holiness. In the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, whenever we read the word consecrate, whenever we, ever, when we read the word sanctify or holy, it's just one word. There's no distinction made in the Hebrew. I guess for variations, we do that for, so that it doesn't sound so monotonous. And so we read sometimes consecrate, sanctify, or make holy, but it's the same word, kodesh. Kodesh is the word that constantly is being used in the Bible to define God and to define certain things that God called holy or made holy or calls to be holy. So this morning, we're not going to have a sermon that will make us holy. We can't have a consecration service. The church can't make anyone holy. The only one that can make anything holy is God. And for us to think that a church service somehow consecrates us is foolishness. A church service can point us to the one that will lead us, grant us this experience we call holiness. And this morning I want to look at four areas. Before I even do this, I forgot to make this point. You are already consecrated. You are already consecrated. The, moment, the day you accepted Jesus into your life, his righteousness made you, makes you holy. So for us to have a service that says, Let's, let us consecrate ourselves, does violence to that experience that you've already had. We need to be better educated as to how to relate to God through holiness. Because it's lack of information that leads many people to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior but then wait for special weeks of prayers and for evangelistic series to then consecrate themselves to the Lord. The moment you and I accepted Jesus Christ into our life, we were given the Holy Spirit. And it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that yields that experience of holiness in our lives. We're going to look at four areas in our lives. The title of the sermon is All of Me. 
And I would like to present that these four areas encompass all of, it, all of what I am, all of what you are. And to begin with, the first area, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. I invite you to open your Bibles to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. Consecration is not a momentary experience. Consecration is a lifestyle. It's a continual, ongoing, nonstop lifestyle. And God, through the Bible, presents those areas in our lives that constitute all of us, what, what I am, all of what I am, all that encompasses who I am. And God because of the sin that we've, we've experienced, is constantly calling us to return, to yield, to experience this holiness. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work when he had done. I'm sorry, I started in verse 2. Verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day, and what is that next word? Kodesh, he consecrated it, he sanctified it, other translation says he made it holy. God made time holy, something untouchable, unmovable, unreachable, we cannot blow it up, we cannot change it, we cannot take Holiness and say, well, we're going to shift it over here and make this holy now. God blessed something intangible to us, but you, all of us experience it. That's time. And when he blessed and sanctified, made time holy, he did it in an environment that was sinless. So this environment of holiness of time, what we call Sabbath, is so much more needful now that we have a world seeped and saturated in unholiness. The entering into the experience of Sabbath holiness, of holy time, causes us to look at our watch and look at our calendars and realize that God is not calling us just to experience holiness of time during Sabbath. Sabbath recalibrates our values and our priorities so that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the rest of that time also experiences holiness. Because holiness is a lifestyle. Consecration is a lifestyle. It's not something that gets experienced only in a few hours or only in certain places. That's paganism. Paganism has holy sites, holy shrines. Places on earth that here is not so holy, but if you walk over here and you step into this building, now you're somehow especially being influenced by physical environment. God blessed something that we can quantify and measure, but we can't control. His holiness comes to us week after week. That reminder of an experience of what holiness is. And Sabbath is a day that is being set apart. It's a unique day that is, 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 is a parable. God set it apart for something special. And in this world of sin, when we enter into the experience of Sabbath, when Sabbath ends, I am reminded once again that because I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, He has granted me this Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this holiness that I am reminded of and that I expose myself on a weekly basis, I take with me throughout the rest of my time, throughout the rest of my life. It's not something that I leave behind in the pew at church. Amen? That's number one. By the way, I am surprised that especially the ladies, oh, well, one lady, noticed that I am not fully dressed. I have an incomplete suit. 
this morning. We'll move on. Part 2. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Let us turn there in our Bibles. Exodus 13, verse 2. Uh, now you're looking. <laughs> Exodus 13, verse 2. Keep your Bible closed this morning. We're going to get a little bit of calluses in our fingers because we're going to be looking at several passages. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. We've already looked at God calls us to experience time on Sabbath as a reminder that the rest of that time belongs to him as well. My life belongs to him, not just one day out of the week, but all seven days my time belongs to God. Amen? Second part says, Exodus chapter 13, verse 2 says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, is what? It's mine. Now, this is in the context of God wanting to keep a reminder to Israel of that fateful night in Egypt when they had to take a lamb and dab the doorpost with blood. And in any household that did not have blood, what took place in that home? Death of the firstborn. And God designed this in such a way that, of course, he, did not, he, he would ask for the sacrifice of the firstborn of the animals, but of the redemption of the firstborn child firstborn boy, so that if you read the context, it wasn't supposed to just stop there. It was done in such a way that children would be left scratching their heads saying, why are my parents doing this? And the, the, if you keep reading that passage in, in, in chapter 13 of Exodus, God tells them, your children will, will ask you, why are we doing this? And when they ask you, you will tell them, we do all of this so that we don't forget that God redeemed us from the slavery in Egypt. Tuck everything I've just said behind your ear, one more passage that we need to look at, 2 Chronicles 31, 18. This is introductory to what we will read in 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians. Chronicles is in the Old Testament. People sometimes get those confused. 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 18. Now, this is in the context of the apostasy has taken place. They've been in exile, and now they have returned back to Jerusalem, and they're rebuilding things, and they're establishing once again the priestly uh, lineage, the, the priestly work. But we are a royal priesthood as Christians. So it's very, this text has a specific meaning for us, together what we just read in Exodus chapter 13. 2 Chronicles 31, verse 18 says, And to all who are written in the genealogy, their little ones and their wives, their sons and daughters, the whole company of them, for in their faithfulness they sanctified themselves in holiness. Chapter 13 of Exodus in 2 Chronicles 31 highlights we don't belong to ourselves. Just like time God has set aside for him, I also have been redeemed. And the context here is very specific. It's almost as if God is saying, parents, you don't own yourself. And take note, you also don't own your children. I have paid for them too. Jesus has paid the price at the cross for every human being. And this call to be holy, to consecrate, to Kodesh, 
It's a call for parents to consecrate, to experience this consecration, not just at church, but first and foremost at home. That the children will know and be educated in what holiness constitutes. That holiness is not something that, I mean, truth be told, we, we at times look at church and assign castes, spiritual castes, spiritual levels. When the Bible doesn't have several low, medium, the Bible simply has holiness. And I cannot relate to my home, my family, my children, and say, we choose to be average Christians. That concept is pagan. And we can only relate to God as through paganism. Men invented religions. Men's designings of spirituality or the revealed way, how God reveals how we need to relate to him. And it's emphatically and consistently appealed to us holiness. Because I am holy, be ye holy. Now how that applies to us, of course, is a little different. We will talk about that in this sermon. But for some, I think it's just the heritage of the medieval church still being affected, affecting us today. I don't think we look at holiness as something good and tasty and enjoyable. Would you like to have a holy meal? No, I want a happy meal. <laughs> See, I grew up, when I would hear sermons about pastors saying in, in the Spanish culture, you have to be holy because God is holy and you have to be holy. And in Spanish, we don't have this, that much differentiation of consecration, sanctification, holiness. It's your santo. So that word santo also means saint. And so when the preachers would talk to us about being holy, I had visited some cathedrals in Argentina with my cousins, and I've seen the paintings of the saints. Have you ever seen a painting of a saint? Have you ever seen any of them smile? So when the pastor would say to me at 13, you young people, you need to be holy, I thought, I'll wait till I'm 60. Because then all my faces wrinkle up and I can look like those saints more naturally. <laughs> and so holiness for me was for grandmas that love to knit. It was never beautiful. Then the Bible says that the, 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 it, the priests were supposed to be clothed in the beauty of holiness. Paganism makes holiness is this drudgery, this, this lack of joy and, and, and satisfaction and contentment when all of those attributes are because of holiness. There is no way to experience contentment in the Lord without having holiness in the life. When we talk about holiness, many of us tighten up. Many of us feel uncomfortable because of legalistic baggage that we've been exposed to. And that's not what we're talking about this morning. Or historical spiritual baggage. Presuppositions of what it means to be holy. I'm going to say it several times through the sermon. This is how I've come to define holiness for this sermon. Holiness, listen carefully. Holiness is being madly, blindly, completely in love with God. Write that down as a definition of holiness. For a human being, holiness is being madly, passionately, completely, blindly, nothing held back in love with God. That experience 
cannot be duplicated by anything in this world. Our children need to see that parents enjoy Sabbath. How you relate to Sabbath will, re will teach your children how they will relate to things that are holy. And God has blessed and sanctified a portion of time so that we can, through that portion of time, recognize that my life, my time, also continually needs to be dealt with through holiness. I grew up in this church as a full-fledged, 100% A++++ pagan. And I learned that from my parents. When Sabbath went, so did holiness. Being holy is being a Christian. That's also another healthy way, tangible way of looking at holiness. Holiness is simply being a Christian. And we don't stop being a Christian when the sun goes down on Sabbath, do we? Do we? Should we? Do we? Parents, God has given you a prerogative. My wife and I have a prerogative. We have brought willingly another human being into this world. God will ask the question to Dalina and I, how have you dealt with the gift I've given you? Where are the children I have placed in your care? Have you taught them the beauty of holiness, not just through what you say, but most importantly, through what you do? That's the only way children learn. Gianna, you might catch her doing this very often, putting her hands in her pocket. I do that. I did not know I do that until one day I look over and, and Gianna is looking at me going like this. <laughs> it's a wake up call. Pastors are not holy by default. Pastors, just like you, are holy by choice. Because love is choice. We choose to love madly, completely, blindly, no holds barred. Let us continue. So time, our families, our children, our marriages, all of them need to be related in the context of holiness. It's not something ethereal. It's not something that just touches us in eternity. It is very much a part of our experience now. Let us turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We're on the third part of what constitutes all of me surrendered to the holiness of the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, New Testament. We've seen the time. We've seen our families. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. You there? Romans 12 says, I beseech you, I entreat you, I plead with you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by his kindness, by his love, that you present your what? Bodies a living sacrifice, holy, holy. You present your bodies holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, other translations say, which is your reasonable act of worship. Seventh-day Adventist brings a tremendous, needful contribution to the rest of the Christian evangelical world. The evangelical world has to wrestle, and many scholars in the evangelical world are recognizing that they are more steeped in 
Greek philosophy, which is pagan, than they realized before, and they're slowly weeding it out. One of the strongest ones that dominates the evangelical world is the dichotomy that we have in who we are as humans. They see us as the real me is this entity called the spirit somewhere floating inside of me, and that the body is just a temporary shell. And there are a lot of ramifications from that worldview that is pagan. The Bible teaches us that we are a complete being, that my body is just as part of me as my intellect and my emotions. So it's a complete holistic view, and many evangelical scholar, scholars, praise the Lord, are also discovering that from the scriptures. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we are not immune to the worldview that I spoke about last Sabbath that gets pumped into our system through the media. Sometimes we downplay the importance of the body because we focus on the spiritual aspect of our lives, the spiritual differences and disciplines like prayer and Bible study. We sometimes miss the point that our bodies are also called to be holy. We need to be careful that we don't adopt this view of the body. How many of you have your own car? How many of you are good, good kids? carry really good for your car, like do the cha oil changes, and I can't raise my hand for that one. My wife does. When my wife met me, she led me to repentance. A whole year without changing your car oil. I was like, honey, don't you do that when it starts smoking? Is that the signal? No, honey. So she does it. I'm not a good car keeper. Don't buy a car for me. Now, for those of you that take good care of your cars, or maybe you don't, have you ever rented a car? How do people treat those cars? Just pay a little extra money, get insurance, have a little fun. Let's see how much this baby can do when I press the gas all the way up, and how fast does it stop? And what happens when I'm driving and it's all of a sudden I put it in reverse? What would happen to the transmission? All of these questions get answered with rental cars. Why, why are we so unhesitant to abuse a rental car? Because it's only temporary. It's not the car that we will drive permanently. And that is one of the many ways that this divided view of human nature affects how we treat the body. Hey, it's just a shell. It's just a tent housing the real me inside of me. When I die, I'm free. So what does it matter what I do to the body? It's only temporary, just like a rental car. So it doesn't matter the abuses that I give it. Go to Jude. It's right before Revelation. Jude verse 9. If you know where Revelation is, it's at the very end of the Bible. Jude is right before it. Don't, don't flip because it's only a one-page book. Jude verse 9. There's no chapters. There's only one. It's just Jude 9. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending or in fighting with who? The devil. When he, the devil, disputed about what? The living body or the dead body? Dead body. Now, here's Satan and Jesus fighting over a dead body of Moses. Is the body important? Now, if Jesus and Satan are fighting over a dead body, shouldn't that be enough of an incentive for us to fight for the living one? To care for the living body the best that we can? We cannot downplay what we have been given as a church. We, can't, we call it the health message, and people have taken it to this extreme or that extreme. But the health message is one of the most beautiful blessings our society right now could ever hear. And as a church, we could practice. What I do to my body means something 
when it comes to holiness. And though we do not by any means say that you become holy by doing physical things, like you'll become holy if you do 50 push-ups a day, no, it's not going to affect your holiness. But neglect of the body, mistreatment of the body, willing abuse of the body speaks about an inner reality. Many times what takes place inside gets manifested on the outside. And spiritual inner neglect manifests themselves through outward physical neglect or carelessness. Spiritual inner carelessness, spiritual carelessness. I'm not really careful about what goes into my mind, my ears, my heart. I am mature enough. I've been a Christian long enough that now I can expose myself to certain things and they will not affect me. That will for sure lead to carelessness as to how I treat the body. And Paul is emphatic. Don't you know that your body is the what of the Holy Spirit? And if I destroy my body, it speaks about what I'm already destroying inside. The closer I become to Jesus, the more I will want to take care of this marvelous gift. Though it breaks down and it starts squeaking and squawking the older we get, it is still such a beautiful machinery that it's a gift from God. And I will use my time, and I will use my family, and I will pour my body at the service of God. That's what we just read in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, to present your bodies as a living what? Sacrifice. My body will be a testament of what's inside. How many of you guys can? This can. Actually, it's, I don't know why they call it can, because these are jars. How many of you guys do this? In Bering Springs, a lot of people do th did this, except me. <laughs> I did not know how to do this. I think you boil these, right? And then you suck out the air, something like that. Do you know what's inside here? I don't know if you can read this from where you are. I have two labels. One that says peaches and one that says tomatoes. Which one should go there? Why should the tomato label go in here? That's what's inside. So. Clearly, we need to label on the outside what's on the inside. Why be inconsistent and outwardly live, actually, outwardly live what we claim to be inside? If we claim to be Christians, striving after holiness, and we claim to be tomatoes, why label on the outside peaches? Why dress like the world? Why fashion ourselves with things that are unholy? Is there such a thing as unholy fashion? And don't get me wrong. It's not that you need to wear a dress that drags for 10 feet behind you and wear a turtleneck during the summertime. But modesty is beautiful. You can be tasteful and be holy and look good. So my young friends, old friends, middle friends, males and females, even my closet speaks about holiness. It is my outward label of what I claim to be inside. Why wear things that say peaches when I should be wearing labels that say tomatoes? What's inside is tomatoes. And you can tell it's tomatoes because it says so on the label. And when you look at a Christian, they should not be wearing a t-shirt with a big marijuana leaf. Here's a glow track. No. 
We should not be advertising things that are secular, carnal, sensual. Amen? Not just through logos, but through other things as well. I don't think I need to go too far with this. But see, as Christians, we have said, I am a Christian in church, and I am a Christian in the closet, like Jesus says. Well, Jesus says, look at your closet. <laughs> and what are you labeling yourself with? Does it speak about what you claim to be inside? Because maybe, maybe, just maybe, I may say I am a tomato, but in here are rotten peaches. Holiness does not divide our lives into this is God's and this is yours. Holiness speaks that all of me belongs to God. And my whole life is blindly, passionately, completely surrendered and submitted to God out of love. I do this out of love, not out of fear or, or other things. Out of love. Last one. 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, sorry, 2 Chronicles 31.6. This is the last one. 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 6. Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 6. All of these are offensive to the carnal heart. You mean my time, my personal time belongs to God? If you want to experience holiness, yes. You mean to me, tell me that my family, my marriage, my children, they're mine. No. God has given them to you. They belong to him. He has redeemed them. My body belongs to God, yes. God has redeemed that too. He was fighting over it with the devil. Moses' body. This last one is also highly offensive to the unregenerate, unconverted heart. Second Chronicles 31.6 says, And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities, cities of Judah, brought the what? Tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were what? That's the same Kodesh, which were made holy, consecrated, sanctified to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. There was a many years that I did not bring a penny to God's church. By the way, I need to say this disclaimer because we, we may have visitors. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has set up a beautiful system of tithing and offering. Whatever gets collected here every Sabbath doesn't go to my pocket. Praise the Lord. It goes to the entire world. And the offerings, the local offerings, are to sustain the buildings. We've set up a system in which pastors of larger churches don't get paid more than pastors with smaller churches. We all get paid the same. Praise the Lord for that system. Such wisdom. Such wisdom to counteract the abuses that gets done in the name of Christianity outside. But we need to present that to, to, to visitors and friends so that they are aware that when we talk about tithes and offerings, it's not so that the pastor can drive a Lexus. Praise the Lord for my little Toyota Corolla Hoopty out there. It's faithful. And I'm content with it. And that is something money can give. Contentment. So now that we got that out of the way, I'm not trying to go to Hawaii, okay? That's not why I'm talking about this talking about how you view your bank account. What are your financial priorities? Like I began to say, there were many years that I made, you know that I was a legal immigrant, but I was making more money than my parents for many years. And I did not bring a single penny to the church. You know why? I would hear the pastor tell impassioned stories, and I would hear the Finance committee leader, you know, brings sad puppy study stories. Ooh, I'll give a dollar today. I did not put a single dollar for many years. My reason was 
I'm broke. I'm broke. I need every penny. Actually, I'm living from paycheck to paycheck. That is the experience I had because though I claim to be a tomato, on the inside, I was all peaches with a tomato label. You now you ask me, Ariel, did you have money for Blockbuster every weekend? Amen. Praise the Lord, I did. Three or four movies out of Blockbuster every weekend. I had money to pay for Cinemax, HBO, the movie channel. I had money to pay for internet so that I could watch all sorts of stuff. Sports, of course, ESPN, soccer, football, TV. Ooh, yes, I have money for that. I have money to go and to eat at restaurants. I have money to go and eat fast food. But for the Lord and for the kingdom of God that I claim to belong with, I don't even have a dollar. See, holiness, we can only approach God as pagans or through holiness. Paganism compartmentalizes our lives. This part of my life is spiritual. This part of my life belongs, all of it, to me. And I pay God so that he can take care of my stuff. But the revealed religion of Jesus Christ that comes through us through the word of God turns that completely upside down. The tithe belongs to who? And we say that and we say that. And this is a true statement. What we need to be saying is 100% of what I have belongs to God as a sign, as an outward label that I believe that everything I have belongs to God. I give tithes and offerings. It is an outward manifestation of something inside. It's holiness inside making its way out, manifesting itself by the provision and maintenance of the mission of the church. I want the gospel to make it to the end, to the rest of the world. I want our church to have the resources to do what it needs to do without having to come up front and beg and plead and show charts and say, please give. Blockbuster doesn't beg anyone. Redbox doesn't beg anyone. You walk in front of a red box, it doesn't say, please excuse me, can you rent a movie? People line up behind that thing. People line up to buy iPhones for blocks around the block. They're sold out. But the churches, the churches, God's church, we have to beg We relate to God as pagans when we don't see that my car, my house, my bank accounts, my clothes, all of it, it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ. We would not have none of that. And you say, what? but atheists have homes and cars too. That's right. Jesus says that he makes his sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he sends his rain to the grateful and the ungrateful. God wants humanity to believe he is a good God. A holy good God. God wants to transform humanity bent on treating God and relating to God on human-made terms that hurt us and convert us. The moment I began to tithe and commit it, and this is illegal immigrant, beloved, making less than minimum wage. And I still made more than my parents, so that lets you know how much my parents were making. But the moment I committed, without appeals, without no one crying with a puppy story about why I should give tithes and offerings to the church, it was because I became converted. No one had to plead with me. And there were scandals, and there were things that people would say, oh, the church does this. I don't care. I love Jesus. Blindly, passionately, completely, I'm holding nothing back from my Savior who held nothing back from me. Holiness will follow you in your time, what you put in your calendar. 
Holiness will follow you in your home. What kind of books do you buy for your children? What kind of movies do you buy for your children? What kind of video games do you buy for your children? What kind of apps do you allow, do you allow them to, pay, to spend time with? How much television do you allow them to spend? Is the amount of television you allow your child to watch commensurate to the amount of time they read the Bible and are exposed to spiritual things? Is it at least even? Holiness affects from the outside labels. What the world will see me outwardly should reflect my inward conversion. Amen? And the church, listen carefully. It is a shame. And I was part of that shame. Bertie was the name of the treasurer of the Harrisburg First Seventh-day Adventist Church. And because I was deacon, they would invite me sometimes to church board meetings. And it was March. Bertie passed out the finance report. And as soon as she passed it out, she broke down in sobs and tears. She said, we need to shut the church down. We are behind three months with our heating bill. When we built our church, we built it in the 50s, 60s, when coal and all those resources were cheap. So no insulation, just brick and stained glass. You, you were heating the entire community every time you turned the heater at that church. It was expensive. And we couldn't keep up with it. And I saw her crying. And it didn't do nothing to me. I said, well, there's his brothers that own a construction company. They're, they're pretty well off. They can help. We have people that are wealthy in my church, in the Harrisburg First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let them take care of that. I'm a poor Hispanic. Pobrecito. I'm excused. I was unconverted. I did not love Jesus. When we love Jesus, there's only one way to love. When I was dating Daleen, I was telling her about, we were sharing about our past experiences. And I told her that I was dating this young lady that would tell me, Ariel, I love you, but I don't love you, love you. Women talk like that. Guys don't understand that. <laughs> Dictionary of womenhood. Three likes equals love. Three loves equals I really love you. Ten loves, I'm going to marry you. Darlene told me, Ariel, when, it, when women tell you that they love you, but they don't love you, love you, what they're telling you is that they don't love you. <laughs> is that true? There's only holiness, not gradations of holiness. There's only love, not love, love. I have been faithful with my tithes and offerings long before I got my heart. God helped me stay off of debt. God helped me pay bills, be able to get nice clothing, be able to have a faithful vehicle, little Hyundai accent that I've gone coast to coast in this country. And God would let me think of those things when I would be driving in the highways of South Dakota and I would see a Lexus SUV with the hood popped up in the side of the road. I'm thinking, Lord, that was a Lexus, my little, my little Hyundai. You're keeping this thing alive. Should have croaked a long time ago, especially with an owner like me. Your angels were changing my oil or something. But because I chose to be faithful, holiness was my lifestyle. God delights when his children love him. And I've already told you, holiness is a heart response. A blind, impassioned, complete, all of me. I'm not going to come to church with my suit, 
and my tie and my pants. Be glad that I'm not as bold as I used to. I almost thought about coming to church without pants, but I decided I'll just come to church with flip-flops. See how many people notice. Only three of you did. Doesn't matter. I knew. I knew. Though I had pants and belt and tie, I was not all. I was not all. It was not all of me for God. I want all of me for God. I don't want inconsistencies to linger in my life. And it's a journey. But the journey begins when one commits, doesn't it? It has a choice. It has to deal with a choice. Who wants to be all for God? Come. Be all for God. Come. Don't look around. If you're all for God, and if you think it's hard to stand up for God in church, wait until you get into the real world and you really have to stand up for God then. Stand up for God now. Let people begin to get begin to get used to people seeing you make decisions for God. And safe is the church is the safest place where you can make decisions for God. It's expected. All of me for Jesus. All my time, all my body, all my health, through sickness, through whatever experiences. My family, my children. What I do with my children, how I relate to their appreciating holiness. Spouses, husbands, what a call to a holy life we have from the word of God. That we may enjoy happiness in our marriages till Jesus comes. It's neglect of that holiness that wrecks marriages. All of me for God, always, all the time, until Jesus comes. Amen. 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 Father, forgive us if we've forgotten and left our first love. That first love that no matter how tired we were, no matter how poor we were, we were happy to bring things for you, to say, this is for my God. This time, these resources, my body, what I do with it, my resources. The world, Father, has taken so much. I have given so much to the world through many years. And I have wept before you, Lord, ashamed. Ashamed to have put a label on the outside that was not real on the inside. What joy holiness brings to those who learn to surrender all, to surrender relationships, to surrender careers, to surrender those things, Father, that we have been asking you for years to trust. To not put conditions in our following after you. If you do this, then I will do that. Forgive us for treating you as an idol. Forgive us for doing Christianity as if it were pagans. Forgive us, Father, for our poor prayer life. We will gladly give football three hours and fall asleep five minutes in your presence. We'll gladly give the world our time and our resources for outward show while inside we're spiritually bankrupt. Romans 5 says that you have poured your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Again, with repentant hearts, with convicted hearts, we ask, not because we deserve it, but because we desperately need your Holy Spirit in our lives to give us sensitivity to your voice when we walk through life during the week. 
sensitivity to your voice through the challenges in our marriage. Sensitivity to your voice as we, as we raise our children in a way that is worthy of your name. Your Holy Spirit, as we relate to our bodies, our outward appearance. Your Holy Spirit, as to how we choose to invest the funds you've entrusted us with. Today, this Sabbath day, I give you all of me, Lord. And there are brothers and sisters who in their hearts are echoing that prayer. Today, we give you all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord. Amen. amen.